Hey everyone, welcome to podcast number four, The Entrepreneur's Hangout. I am here with one of my new favorite peeps, Rahan Riaz, and he is he is coming in all the way from Pakistan. So I am so, so thrilled that you took out of the time, and I know I think it's about 11 o'clock at night time there. We are at 11 o'clock here in our little lovely downtown Culpeper. Ron, thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, pleasure. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Kylie, for having me. I'm super pumped and excited to be here. And uh, I'm really glad to share the thoughts and all that stuff. So again, I would like to thank you, Kylie, for making it happen. Oh, you're awesome. You're awesome. So I think it's kind of an interesting um, um, way of how we met. And I'll just kind of start in and then, then you can kind of give me your two cents. But uh, I was looking for um, a, a scaling partner, somebody that um, aligned with my vision of what my clients needed, which was how to scale, how to be promote more productive, and how to get your systems in place. So I went searching the world wide web, and I found Farhan. It immediately, immediately, I knew you were the guy. I was so excited. And um, I think it's personally because our, 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 our principles and values and morals aligned, but I want to hear exactly. from you on that. Uh, exactly. I would think uh, we read it, hit it off right away. And uh, it's not easy to explain, but when someone's values are aligned, you kind of feel that. It's not like easy to articulate that in words. So I believe uh, it was uh, the same way from my side. And um, uh, we hit it off right away. And I, I'm so glad that like, I found you because um, whenever we are into scaling and marketing, but it has to be, although it's like we're your remote team and we're working remotely, but you feel the connection, which mm-hmm. is which transcends the geographies. So I believe the values are is a key. The driver is a key driver in building the team and uh, making it big right, in, along your journey. So I think that's very much there, and uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Speaking of big, um, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your um, incubator space? there in um, Pakistan. I find it completely fascinating. And um, I'm sure that my listeners uh, want to hear more. Uh, sure. So uh, it started, it, it, it was interesting because a bit about myself. So I've, I've done a lot of ventures. I've done very few of them initially were successful. Let's call it the beginner's luck. And then I failed 15 of them in a row. Uh, So anyway, but by the virtue of that, I had been teaching entrepreneurship since 2011 in a university where I co-founded the Department of Entrepreneurship. We designed curriculum and I designed two courses uh, as the syllabus of them. Uh, One was uh, the entrepreneurial marketing and the other one was idea generation and creativity. I had to teach people how to think and think in a way to ask to produce lucrative business ideas. So this was one. So what we were doing, all that interesting stuff like hacking the inventor's mindset. Uh, we were reading about Thomas Edison, we had Edward D. Bono, uh, lateral thinking and all that, and how we can use neuro-linguistic programming to install the traits of the very creative people like Mozart, Michelangelo, stuff like that. Then we did in the entrepreneurial marketing, we were uh, studying about how to create cult branding, how to create your tribe, uh, mm-hmm. Facebook ads, Google ads, and all that stuff. But again, um, I'm moving into the timeline. Then uh, I got an offer from a university, which happens to be Pakistan's one of the best and the oldest engineering university, more than 100 years old. So uh, I, I got the chance to set up an incubator over there. So I founded that in the year 2015. And uh, it wasn't easy because entrepreneurship is a was a pretty new word back then, especially in that university, the culture it had. So a lot of lobbying, a lot of politics, I would say. But initially, I fought and uh, pushed my agenda. And I'm really thankful that like, these days, uh, till date, we have incubated 85 startups so far. Wow. And um, 
I would like to like uh, uh, you guys uh, uh, to notice. I would want you guys to notice that this these are the guys who graduated just like two years ago, and also these are it's like a we're a developing country, so the ecosystem is not as cool as the Silicon Valley's. So there are a lot of hurdles culturally speaking, uh, ecosystem from the ecosystem perspective and all that. So anyway, so we incubated eighty five startups. Um, those guys who would have been looking for jobs uh, after they graduated, graduated two years ago, now they are giving jobs, which mm -hmm. is, I believe, super cool. Like instead of being an employee, they become an employer. So uh, the numbers won't be as big as maybe you guys are used to in the States, but uh, for my incubator, uh, 85 startups, they created 250 small-scale jobs. More than 50 of them were females. Collectively, they generated more than half a million dollars in revenue. Some of the startups have raised more than $10 million, and their company is evaluated at more than $150 million. And that's those guys who graduated two years ago in Pakistan. And I mean, like, I'm super proud of them. And the other thing, some of the companies are making games and earning to the mark of $50,000 a month. That's and awesome. again... Uh, in a developing country, that's a lot of money. And uh, yeah, they got a team of 14 to 20 people. Now I, they've graduated living in mountainous areas in a retreat, making games and all that. <laughs> so this is what we made. We made it happen. And most importantly, um, we are creating enabling environment to include the women's side because we believe social inclusion is the way thing. And uh, to create impact, we have to include all the genders and not only genders, all the community members uh, to create when we're talking about impact. So we have enabled a lot of female um, entrepreneurs from the country and uh, that feels really good. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, we have also been running uh, vocational training programs, which are uh, because uh, in Pakistani culture, and I would say almost all around the world, in Pakistani culture, as soon as someone graduates, their parents expect them to go find a job so mm -hmm. that they can uh, make money, so that they, they can find someone to marry, make babies, and repeat. When entrepreneurship enters the circle, what happens is the cash flow cycle gets uh, disturbed. And uh, that overall disturbs the whole cultural thing because... And because of that, uh, the initially the parents of the um, baby boomer generation, our parents, they're not very comfortable with the startup thing. So what I thought, like, what if we introduce some cash cows so that when they would be about to launch their venture, they would have a good cushion of some fine uh, monthly income. So for that, I introduced freelancing and uh, I partnered with a government institute and we have now, uh, till date, we have graduated more than 1,000 students who uh, we have, they're working on the freelancing platforms and generating at least $500 a month. And uh, that's equivalent to the salary of the big companies uh, if they would have been doing, doing jobs. So this also enables the entrepreneurial cycle. And other than that, we're also offering a training programs in the high-end trades like artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. computer vision, and uh, renewable energy, bioinformatics, you name it. So we, uh, like in the last cohort for this vocational training program, we got 5,000 applications. Wow. And now we're now we're training in this course 600 students in these 20 trades. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I believe uh, uh, we'll be talking a lot about other stuff in the when in my ventures, marketing, scaling. But I believe uh, very humbly, this is the achievement of, I'm proud of, like enabling, creating the enabling environment so as to create livelihoods, create jobs, uh, poverty alleviation, or empowerment, whatever you may call it. Mm -hmm. So this is something I'm. Very humbly, but I think so. This is something I'm proud of. And uh, and so you should you be. So you should be. Before uh, uh, before we take a break for our sponsors, I think that um, you hit the nail on the head, which is entrepreneurship actually creates more jobs because then therefore, you know, it's not just somebody going to work, for example, you know, at a coffee shop or whatever it is. It's like you're creating something that's going to then therefore create more jobs. So, exactly. Yeah, no. uh, because uh, before you go on your break, uh, I would like to I have been teaching. It's been almost 10 years now since 2011. Mm -hmm. So I've been associated with academia. 
but very respectfully, I believe the educational system we are following all around the globe, and especially in Pakistan, it's the post Second World War when we uh, needed labor for our mm. third industrial revolution. Now it's the fourth industrial revolution. Now the things have changed. The economic dynamic, the dynamics of the economy have changed. Now it's a different ball game, and a lot of the mainstream does not realize that. So Great. now it's uh, entrepreneurship is the way to go. Maybe I'm biased because that's what I do, but I wholeheartedly believe in this idea that entrepreneurship is the vehicle mm-hmm. that's going to solve mm-hmm. problems at societal level and on industrial level, and you name it. I agree. I agree. Thank you very much, everybody. Stay tuned. A little word from our sponsors, and we're going to be right back. This is Aaron from Elevate uh, Coworking, and we're happy to be hosting uh, not only the Entrepreneurs Hangout physical sessions, but also the Entrepreneurs Hangout podcast. Elevate a Coworking Community is a membership and subscription-based co-working space in downtown Culpeper, located right on Davis Street, as well as an awesome community to be a part of. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Um, Farhan and I were just gotten so deep in our conversations that um, it's just so easy because we're so passionate about speaking about entrepreneurship. Um, Farhan, just, just repeat what you said about how they learn, about how entrepreneurs, how, how, how entrepreneurs learn. In uh, entrepreneurship, uh, we were discussing um, that, like, in the academia, how we teach entrepreneurship via books. Um, so there's, there's nothing wrong in teaching, teaching the theory and all that, but generally in the books, uh, or at least the books we follow here, we're talking about uh, respectfully to Mr. Joseph Schumpeter. He developed the so-and-so theories in the 18th century and all that, but that's so old school. And other than that, uh, I mean, like there are so many amazing books and literature out there and we definitely should uh, read and learn via them. But uh, it's something that has to be done practically to understand that. You can teach all about the cash flows and stuff uh, on the books, but you cannot fully understand it unless you go through it. What it means to have your first sale and what it means to fail. Mm -hmm. Uh, For instance, as I told you, I failed more than a dozen ventures. Uh, I felt like a loser. And uh, when you're in the entrepreneurial depression and the other day you were feeling on the top of the world. So what is, it, it cannot be taught via books. That's mm-hmm. my point of view. Point. So we need to do the hand holding uh, because that involves the emotional experience. That's like the holistic learning part. So it can be only done. If, I'm sure a lot of uh, universities uh, all around in the States, they're doing this way, but uh, they have to do it practically. Yes, they have to get the mentorship from their instructor, or they can teach them about the best practices, how they can bypass the learning curve, or make things, you're still going to make mistakes, but let's make sure that uh, you minimize the uh, risk you mm-hmm make fewer mistakes or make newer ones every time. So I think so. This is why handholding is very important. And this is where uh, we get the mentorship part. Uh, For instance, today, like three hours back, I was with one of my mentors and, uh, and I did this part. uh, uh, I wish I would have done that like several years ago. It would have saved me a lot of time. So if, People, if the new aspiring entrepreneurs, they start right away. I believe they can save a lot of of their time, their valuable Mm -hmm. time, and create impact uh, problem solving in uh, less failure uh, because there's you, there are a lot of fair chances you're going to fail so there's a in lean startup we call that fail and learn or learn you fail you learn you fail you learn and this is like an iterative approach and uh, unless you find that sweet spot so the main thing is to uh, minimize that uh, cycle mm-hmm. that value chain and uh, reach your aha moment as soon as possible right so th- that's that's what handholding can do for you. So in the incubator space, uh, in your, if uh, all the listeners out there, they have in their universities nearby accelerators. I believe that's really, really important to join them. Or maybe you can join some other programs, which Kylie and we'll uh-huh. be talking about. Exactly. Yeah. So I believe 
uh, uh, entrepreneurs hang out. Uh, Kylie knows her stuff. So uh, you definitely should listen to Kylie. And uh, if people are in other geographical parts, uh, but get mentorship yes. from anywhere, wherever you think, so that those guys know their stuff. Uh, get mentored ASAP. You know, that's the way to do it. And I agree. And one of the things too, when you talk about failing, um, I know a lot of people that are like, oh my gosh, but I, I, there's no ways I can fail. You know, I, I can't fail at anything. Well, then entrepreneurship is not for you because I have, okay. I have some businesses that have been phenomenally successful. I have some things that have not done very well. Yeah. Early on, I, I would try to like breathe life into them and pump them and just try to, you know, because I'm like, I just can't ever shut the lights off, right? But no, it's like this. Fail and fail quick. Okay, if it's not going to work, that's okay. Like I take somebody and it is holding the hand. It is, you know, my, I have an approach. It's a triple D approach, right? Where you, um, you drill down, you dive in and you do it. And if somebody comes exactly. to me and they want to sell me on an idea, there are, I, there may be, there are things about that idea, about that business concept that needs to be tweaked. However, um, there is something that you 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 take out, you drill down, you take the parts that are good, you get rid of the things that maybe are not going to work, and you work out the plan. I want to talk a little bit about systems and strategies um, and why it's so important to be able to, in order to scale, you have to be able to have your systems in place. And so you and I, I know we're super passionate about that. In fact, we are busy um, working on a course that we're going to be launching in uh, the very beginning of January. And Rahan, I know um, businesses are, they go through this painful period, which is, I, I know that I can bring in the customers, but the systems and the um, scalability, um, it just isn't there because again, they don't have the systems. And I find that if we can help people build those systems, they will be successful. Give me your thoughts. Exactly. And this is the best thing about systems. Uh, first off, you told you uh, talked about that, uh, um, the systems part and uh, uh, when people fail initially and they don't take that failure in a proper way. So what happens is, and I would say uh, uh, such people are maybe new to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So uh, had it been this easy, everyone would have been a millionaire or a billionaire. <laughs> so it, entrepreneurship is a process uh, maybe let's call it a law of nature, a law of entrepreneurship. It tests your guts. It tests uh, and other and it filters the sure. so it filters a lot from the brave ones from the not so brave ones, the passionate ones from the not so passionate ones. So this is how it works. Because uh, again, I would repeat, uh, had it been this easy, everyone would have it. I'm a millionaire. Again, uh, so when you start off, you believe you maybe have a a bit of arrogance because mm -hmm. entrepreneurs do have it. Mm -hmm. they, sometimes they admit it, sometimes they don't. Like they, but they have that kind of, uh, some people call it a God syndrome. Some people call it megalomania or paranoia, passion for big things. So generally, uh, this, is, this is like tricky. So generally, entrepreneurs have that kind of an uh, obstinate nature, arrogance, until they fail and fail again. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are not entrepreneurial at heart, they would quit at the second or third failure. But those people who just take by, uh, they then come to realize that they have to get help. Uh, and help from someone they would deem an expert in their field. Mm -hmm. So often in the incubation space, we do that as well. And even in some other professional programs we do, we we give that disclaimer that you have to be coachable. You have to be, uh, because a lot of people, it's not easy for them to be mentored because uh, they somehow have those problem in taking instructions and maybe agreeing to that. So first of all, we need to get that in check. And uh, once we have that in check, the other thing is, if I look back at my journey in retrospect, I believe if I were giving advice to my uh, 10 years younger self uh, <laughs> would have done things a lot differently. And I would have cut the fat, the fluff, the some things which uh, and we call it the Pareto's law, 80-20 rule. So we, I would have cut 80% of the stuff that was not creating result. So if you give that checklist, that system to the coming entrepreneurs, 
um, be in the marketing field, scaling thing, or just the initial coaching program, that would create a hell of a difference yep. in their learning curve. Yep. Because either you have two choices. You, uh, a lot of people may or may not agree, but you will eventually find out. One, you'll waste five to six years or maybe 10 years of your life uh, and effort, your time, your money. And again, time, yes, money hurts, but time is the most valuable commodity mm. you would be wasting and learning along the way. So this is one option and figuring it out on your own. Or you may seek help and cut, bypass the learning curve and maybe saving seven to eight years of your life and do that stuff, which would have otherwise taken you 10 years. And uh, now you can do that in one or maybe two years. So, I mean, like the sooner you realize that, the better it is for you. And I believe uh, this way, uh, because uh, statistically speaking, 90% of the startups fail. Uh, the world would have been so much a better place if we could reduce that number. I if agree. we the 10%, if we can increase that 10% to say 20% or maybe more, and that can be done because uh, that can be done because uh, we've boiled entrepreneurship, incubation, systems, scaling down to a science, a methodical step-by-step -step approach. And if you follow that, Yes, you got to work hard. I'm not at all saying that uh, uh, you don't have to work hard. You have to put your hustle in, your grind mode, and, uh, and nothing replaces that. But you definitely save a lot of your time. So I believe systems, uh, we haven't talked in detail about mm -hmm. system. What I believe. But I believe the mentorship and this thing, um, and the systematic approach towards things, that eventually saves you a lot of time. And uh, yes, you may ask other subsequent Yeah, I know. So Farhan just hit the nail on the head. And when we come back, we're going to talk about um, the tenacity that it takes for businesses, but we're going to help you with a great system. So a little word from our sponsor. I want to thank my sponsor, Monica Christian, your commercial expert from Farmers Steel Agency. All right, you guys, welcome back. Welcome back to the Entrepreneurs Podcast. I am here with my really good buddy, Farhan Riaz, and we're talking about systems. So Farhan, if somebody came to you or came to us and said, hey, okay, I'm wanna, I am want to, I think that there's two different ways where in right now in the, where the world is at and say, for example, uh, we've got people that are going to start a business, right? And in my opinion, you've got people that have a business, but are not doing what they want. They're not achieving what their goals are or what their ideal is as to this is not my ideal business. This is not what I want it to be at the end. So just kind of wrapping this up into systems, what would you suggest? A um, Let's start with a person that's going to start a business. All right. Uh, yeah, great question. I would say, uh, suppose if someone is about to start a business, so uh, generally in all my startups who are in new into the incubation round, other programs, other people who are our clients, I always, uh, I'm a big foodie, so I give uh, stupid examples of food which are easy to remember. So let's say after this interview, had I been in uh, States, so maybe I would have said, okay, Kylie and all the team, let's go out for lunch or dinner, mm -hmm. whatever time that would be. So um, I would say there's a new joint uh, down across the street and they serve amazing sushi sashimi. And uh, let's all eat that. Uh, so, okay, if you, if you might say, oh, I love sushi and all that, but maybe some other team members would say, come on, man, I don't like uh, the sashimi, the raw fish kind of a thing. <laughs> but, uh, suppose I said, okay, never mind. I love sushi, sashimi. Let's eat that. Uh, and they would be like, come on, are you crazy? Like, I'm telling you, uh, you're like, I don't like, we don't like the raw fish part. We can take some other version of that. <laughs> okay, what I'm trying to say here is as stupid as it may sound, if I feel like I like a particular food and I'm bulldozing it on uh, the Good guests point. of mine. Good point. So uh, I just like how stupid that is. So that's why I give this example, food, foodie example, because it's easy to understand. Exactly. This is what we startup founders do. One day while taking a shower or driving uh, down to your office, <laughs> you believe I got it. 
cool idea, Eureka. And now Farhan thinks he got the new billion dollar idea. I'm going to disrupt that space, blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada. yada. And actually, no one wants that. It's just like that right. sushi thing I was referring right. to. So it doesn't work out that way. Now, what I could, there's one option. What I can do is I can maybe start building that product, uh, whatever I thought was a good idea, and invest my time, money on that, and uh, eventually to find out no one wants it. This validation. Is one way to go about. I think that's what you're saying is validation. How can you validate? Exactly. It? Exactly. Yep. Yep. The other way could be I say, let's turn the tables. And let's change the sequence upside down, which we know sometimes it's pretty obvious, but we don't do it. The what would have been the best way if, uh, let's say, if I took you guys out to lunch or dinner, mm -hmm. it would have been handing you the menu. You order whatever you want to, whatever entree, whatever uh, food <laughs> from the menu you would like to order. But this is how simple that is. But we, when we're launching startups, we fail to understand that simple point. Ask your customers and give them the menu. Yeah. So we don't do that. So the best way is to, if you want, you want to start a business, is to choose your vertical. Suppose if you may say, you might say, like, I'm going to do XYZ in the retail space, in e commerce space, or in software as a service, SaaS business model, or something uh, regarding fintech, financial technology, or whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing would be you chose your vertical. The other thing would be, now, who would be your ideal customer? Yeah. Get a list of like, let's say, dream 20 customers. Write down their names. Don't sell them the product yet. Go and talk to them. And ask them, what are their, pro what are their most common problems? And how can you solve them? After, okay, that's easier said than done. And I often say to my startups, I'm saying that you go and visit 20 different clients, potential clients mm -hmm. from that chosen industry. And I can write it down with my signature on that. You won't fail. But I can also assure you, you're not going to visit 20 people <laughs> because that's, that's not easy. Even if, had I, if I were to do that, it won't be easy to get off my couch and visit 20 different businesses because it takes effort, time, sure. and it's rather we're not programmed in a, that way to go that route. So we generally don't do it or don't like to do it. But if we were to do it, we would see that after five, six, or seventh of our client, we'll start to see a pattern. Right. We'll start seeing that that particular industry, that particular client we have in a niche, they have a certain kind of problems which are uh, they have the same common denominator, which right. are kind of similar. You take that problem, and now you got your idea. You can take that idea and start building up on that. Yes. It, you know what it is? It is right. It's like, the, what problem are you solving? Who are you serving? Okay, now, exactly. what about, let's say, same kind of question of somebody of, now you've got a business, you've been kind of floundering, you still think it's a good idea, you're still passionate about it, perhaps the, the, the you know, the, the candle burning's going down a little bit because your energy's going down. You've been in it for two or three years, but you're just not doing what you want it to do. What would your suggestion be? Again, uh, I, I get your question. Great one again. Uh, but the problem often is it depends on the nature of business. It's for the varies from uh, some businesses are very inherently very scalable, and especially in the technological niche. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing something online and if you're doing a product in particular, that's very scalable inherently. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing something uh, as we know, a lot of people are doing an amazing job, but uh, as in like some kind of cleaning services, mm -hmm. as in some kind of uh, uh, outdoors, uh, something with their helping, helping their client with any engineering services, anything like that, that's hard to scale. I'm not saying they cannot be scaled, sure. but they're inherently, they have their own challenges. So first off, we need to uh, identify what's your business. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is the business model revamp. They'll have to see how can, and that's not easy part, by the way. Right. Uh, we'd be discussing that more about it in the course we'd be launching. But uh, I think so, uh, because time, uh, because of the shortage of time, we cannot go into exact details. But uh, very superficially, if I, if I were to give an outline, we'll have to kind of change the vehicle. For instance, if, uh, again, if first off, it depends on the founder. Does mm -hmm. the founder have that vision or not? 
some people are better off making 10 grams a month. Right. But there are other other people who would be like, no man, like 10 grand is a pretty good amount of money to live your life off comfortably maybe. Uh, but the founders, some of those people who have that entrepreneurial itch, they want to grow, they don't settle. Mm-hmm. So they might be like, I want to make 100K mm-hmm. or maybe more than that sure. a month. So for that, you need to change your vehicle. For instance, if you're in kind of a normal state car or an SUV, now you might need a supercar like a Ferrari or something like that. <laughs> so that Ferrari, that uh, supercar is your different business model, which mm-hmm. would make it possible to go at that top gear. So generally, those business models, uh, for instance, uh, one of a really good, it's very cliche, just to give you an example, but I find this example beautiful. What the biggest hospitality company in the world does not own a single room, mm-hmm. Airbnb. Yeah. That's the beauty of the business model. Yeah. The biggest transportation company in the world does not own a single vehicle, Uber. I think uh, you're thinking the, too, I think you're thinking or saying it's like you have to think outside the box. But we do outside the box, yes. yes. We do acknowledge though that, for example, you know, you've got to know what your what your goals are. And if exactly. it's you know, for me, it's less important about like, okay, how much money you make, because you're going to be the one that says, you know, for me, I find that the reason people start their own business is because of freedom, freedom, it allows them to have the freedom to do what they want to make the amount of money they want. Um, But then sometimes small businesses without the systems, and in place, then their freedom goes away, because they're completely bogged down. Exactly. What, our, what uh, I think is we, we have to help solve that problem. Okay, so uh, I, I'll kind of deviate from what I was discussing and uh, discuss what you're saying right now. This is the beautiful point. The reason you started business in the first place was, yes, it's more money, and that's pretty mm-hmm. obvious, but why do you even want more money? So that you want freedom and Mm -hmm. that freedom has a different, it's a relative term. Everyone has different definition of freedom and success. Someone would like to travel the world. Someone would like to help their family or whatever that might be. One thing is if your business is chaining you and it's, uh, you have even tons and tons of more commitment on your part. At the end of the day, you feel like you're a victim uh, and you would have been thinking like nine to five was way better. Uh, <laughs> it was a way more, uh, lesser risk. Uh, you, you, you had a peace of mind, although you were working hard, but you had peace of mind and you were uh, sure of the consistent monthly paycheck at right. least. So uh, it is, and now we'll be talking about systems. The thing is, uh, it's a very uh, classic definition, uh, but, uh, that pretty much explained. Business is an entity which is separate from its owner. Business is separate from its owner. But mm-hmm. what happens is, um, even a lot of startups initially, and, 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 and it's kind of a, initially, it's kind of a necessary evil. Like you have to do it. You have to work your socks off or maybe grind harder, hustle. But unless you take it to a certain point, and after that, you need systems. Sometimes there are smart entrepreneurs, and they had been a veteran. They had been doing this. They would start right off the bat with proper system. The choice is yours. But anyway, the business is an entity which is separate from its owner. But what happens is, generally, business owner is like an interchangeable. It's synonymous. Mm-hmm. So it's like I guess you might be self-employed, but you might not be owning a business if you cannot go on to a vacation for one week or two weeks and you turn, turn your phone off. And if your business is still thriving, then you have a business. Very so good you point. Grow. Very good point, so, Rohan. And if, so if the, what systems help you do is it helps you subtract yourself out of the equation. If your business can work in your absence and you have a business, boom. Otherwise, you don't have a business. You're merely self-employed with an illusion that you own a business. Yes, that self-employment might be paying you well, but it's also robbing you, taking your life away from you. So when you rem- another beautiful thing that happens right now, what I'm discussing is when you subtract yourself out of the equation, your life becomes at ease. That's the best part. 
And another beautiful thing that happens is a uh, byproduct is your business starts growing even faster. 100%. Because you, you were the bottleneck in the business. <laughs> now when you remove that bottleneck, and what happens is like, it becomes like miraculously taking leaps and leaps and leaps. So the best part about that is you need to systematize your business, create systems. And so that I call it like, uh, I was, I'm trying to write a book because uh, it's like halfway through and I call it the systems voodoo, how to clone <laughs> yourself and hire an army of robots and how to clone yourself. You can, for instance, uh, I I know you, Kylie, and you're awesome. You're all over the place. You have a very dynamic personality, and I know you don't like to micromanage and right. all that. You think yeah. about you're thinking about the bigger picture and all that. Sometimes there might be some other business owner who maybe likes to micromanage because you have that. Everyone oh, yes. has different kind of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. personality, and that's exactly what you assess in your quizzes as well. So first off, you need to identify your entrepreneurial personality. Then uh, you need to clone yourself. Like uh, uh, Kylie should be cloned in the form of SOPs and processes and policies so that people, there is a one Kylie may, who is maybe off on a vacation, but the Kylie should be there in the form of policies, mm -hmm. processes, and systems and the SOPs yes. so that anyone from your team would know that even down to this point that Kylie does not like this color or XYZ font. Brilliant. Uh, so so, so now I, I often, I love to give that example of uh, McDonald's. Maybe they don't make best burgers, uh, but they definitely have the best business processes because I say anyone who has zero culinary or kitchen skills <laughs> yeah. or a guy like me, if he goes down into the kitchen and let's say if I were to work in McDonald's and I don't know nothing how to make a burger, suppose. So what I would be doing, I would be following their manual mm -hmm. on the way. It would be like, I don't know, I'm just making it up. It would be like, number one, take the burger patty and put it on the grill. Number two, set the grill to XYZ temperature. Number three, meanwhile, prepare the salad. Number four, do that. And uh, to, uh, to the point that I will find out, oh man, I made a burger. So that's like the beauty of the good processes and stuff. Mm. And how do you create processes and SOPs for all of your things? How to kind of collect it in a way, how to seamlessly integrate it so that your business works without you. That's one hell of an art. So, and it's rather a science. So th that's exactly what we would, uh, we discuss with our startups, with our clients and all. But I think so that pretty much explained the systematiz systematization part. Uh, uh, I, I believe I've covered a lot. You may ask other questions. To oh, I, love it. I love it. Before we wrap it up, I think it's also important to say, you know what, this is, whether you're a big business or a small business or an entrepreneur, you need systems. You need to be able to have it. I don't care if you're whatever amount of money you want to make, but if, if you don't put these systems in place, you're not going to be happy with your business. Your business is going to swallow you up. Exactly. Okay. Thank well. you so much. And um, I will certainly keep our listeners. Um, please like and subscribe. And then you're going to hear about our course on how to scale. And it's perfect timing because it's going to be coming 2021. I know we're all excited to have it come, knowing, you know, we don't know what it's going to bring us, but we do know if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to be have the tenacity. So thank you so much, Rahan. Bye. Thanks. Love to all your family. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure talking about that. Like, uh, I really believe in the cause. And uh, I think so. Keep up the great work, Kylie. You're really making a difference. And your podcast is doing amazing. Keep on inviting good speaker so your listeners can grow and maybe uh, make the world a better place. So thank you very much for having me. Have a great day. Have a great holidays. Bye. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. And if you love the podcast, please like and subscribe and share it with your buddy. Remember, I cannot do this without you.
are JG Design, the proud producers of Entrepreneur's Hangout with Kylie Dahl. We are a company that specializes in video and audio production that will elevate your business and add value to your brand. Find us at jgdesignonline.com for more information.